Hello and welcome back. So in the second video of the mitochondrial oxidants and antioxidant class, uh, I want to talk about general properties of mitochondrial oxidant production. So what we have here is a scheme of the mitochondrial electron transport chain, plus a few other components in mitochondria that are involved in the production of these species. Now typically mitochondrial oxidant production has been seen to occur in a few of the mitochondrial complexes. Complex 2 has been reported to generate oxidants. We'll see it's involved in reverse transfer, but mainly complexes 1 and complex 3. So the production of mitochondrial oxidants in complex 1 is because of a single electron transfer of an electron to oxygen generating superoxide radicals. This happens in sites within complex 1 that are upstream of the rhodonone inhibitory site. So rhodonone is an inhibitor of complex one. When it's added, it makes the rest of these components all reduced, and this increases the leakage of electrons from complex one. The increase in leakage of electrons is also seen with high membrane potentials, which of course will lead to more reduction of all these components within complex one. Another source of electron leakage within complex one is what we call reverse electron transfer. And this happens when electrons in coenzyme Q, it usually came from complex 2, but could come from other sources of reduction of coenzyme Q, uh, are transferred back to complex 1. Now, typically, this cannot uh, happen under most physiological conditions, but it can happen if you have an inhibition of the respiratory chain upstream of coenzyme Q, or if you have very high membrane potentials, which makes all this electron transfer less favorable thermodynamically. Under these conditions, coenzyme Q can re-reduce complex one. And these electrons now are basically in a place in which they can't go forwards anymore, and they tend to reduce oxygen and generate superoxide radicals. Reverse electron transfer also happens in sites that are upstream of the rotenone inhibitory site. And that's why inhibiting complex one with rotenone inhibits reverse electron transport, but has no effect on the electron transport rates forward from complex two on, because those don't involve complex one. Uh, in addition to reverse electron transfer and complex one, complex three is known to be an important site of the production of superoxide radicals and mainly because of the Q cycle within complex three. The Q cycle involves the formation of a radical, the semiquinone radical, and this semiquinone radical can uh, donate an electron to oxygen generating superoxide radicals. And we know that inhibiting complex three with mixothiazole, which prevents the formation of semiquinones, is going to inhibit this production of superoxide radicals. On the other hand, antimycin A, an inhibitor of complex three that increases the amount of semiquinone, doesn't let the semiquinone go on within the cycle, will increase the leakage of electrons in complex three, generating superoxide radicals. These inhibitors will also increase reduction uh, in coenzyme Q and complex one, and therefore can increase the production of superoxide in complex one. Now, in addition to these respiratory chain sites, one must not forget that mitochondria can also produce oxidants by other enzymes present in mitochondria, and mainly in flavoenzymes present in mitochondria. So a major source of oxidants in mitochondria can be flavoenzymes that are on the outer leaflet of the inner mitochondrial membrane, such as glycerol phosphate dehydrogenase and monoamine dehydrogenase. It's not here. These can be major sources of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Uh, other flavoenzymes participate in the metabolism of fatty acids. So acyl-CoA dehydrogenase, the electron transferring flavoprotein, and ETFQ oxidoreductase are also potential sources of oxidants in mitochondria. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit further on about alpha-ketoglutarate and other flavoenzymes in the matrix, such as pyruvate dehydrogenase, which also can generate superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. So when you're talking about oxidant production, there are many different enzymes in mitochondria because there's so many oxidation reduction reactions that can generate these species. So a few years ago, more than a few years ago, actually in 2009, 
Uh, my lab did something that we kind of jokingly said was a mitochondrial reactive oxygenome, in which we measured mitochondrial uh, hydrogen peroxide release in many different tissues, with many different substrates, with many different respiratory states, and uh, inhibitors of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation to look at the general properties of mitochondrial oxygen production. We didn't find anything absolutely new. Um, basically, we were confirming things that other people had shown. But I think we, by doing it all together in one place, came to some general properties of mitochondrial oxygen production. And that's why I want to bring to you the, the final conclusions of this paper, because I think these general properties are things that are worth having a look at and remembering. So the first general conclusion of this paper is that both complexes one and three, as was already known, are important sources of superoxide in mitochondria. But in addition to complexes one and three, we saw very clear evidence, which confirmed data that was done before, that flavoenzymes in mitochondria are important sites of mitochondrial oxidant production. And here I really have to talk about the work that was published in parallel by Treder and Adam Vesey and Starkov and Gary Fiskin's group, in which they uncovered alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase as an important source of oxidants in mitochondria. First of all, uh, this was evidenced by the fact that the generation of hydrogen peroxide in mitochondria was much higher than expected with alpha-ketoglutarate versus the redox state of NADH and other substrates. So this indicated that this enzyme had something different, something special. And actually, if you look at isolated alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase or pyruvate dehydrogenase, which is structurally very similar, uh, you can see that both these enzymes are capable of producing superoxide radicals by themselves. And they produce more of these superoxide radicals when NAD, oxidized NAD, is absent. So when they don't have a recipient for the electrons within their normal catalytic state. And this proof that alpha-ketoglutarate dehydrogenase really is an important source of oxidants in vivo, they looked at partial knockouts of the dihydrolipoyl dehydrogenase, which is the flavoenzyme portion of this enzyme. And what they can see is that when this part of this enzyme is absent, the generation of hydrogen peroxide is much lower in the presence of alpha-ketoglutarate. So this really shows that enzymes in the mitochondrial matrix are metabolically sensitive sources of mitochondrial oxidants, and I think they're really overlooked as important sources of oxidants in many different biological paradigms. So always remember that. So in addition to this first conclusion, uh, which strengthens the importance of flavoenzymes, another thing that we found was that palmitate, fatty acid, uh, is an important source of oxidants in some tissues, specifically in, in kidney and liver, and liver has a lot of fatty acid oxidation. And the reason for this, again, is because flavoenzymes in fatty acid metabolism can be responsible themselves for the generation of oxidants. And if you're interested in that, Pomela Kakimoto's work from my lab characterized the very long chain of silcoa dehydrogenase, which metabolites palmitate in mitochondria, as a source of oxidants. Uh, another conclusion we came to was that reverse electron transfer from succinate dehydrogenase is an important source of oxidants, and particularly in brain and heart tissue. So uh, I want to exemplify reverse electron transfer here with an experiment. Again, this is data from my group, but we didn't discover reverse electron transfer. It's just that I find it a lot easier to find figures illustrating what I want to say when they're from my group, because I happen to know these figures better. Uh, so what we're seeing here is the generation of hydrogen peroxide measured with Amplex Red. It's a fluorescent probe over time in isolated mitochondria from heart. And what you can see is that you have a very linear production over time of hydrogen peroxide in the presence of succinate as a, a substrate, as an electron donor. When you add ropenone, you're not affecting respiration in these mitochondria in any way because you're giving succinate as a substrate. So we have no change in respiration, which was measured in parallel. However, you have a very steep decrease in this production of hydrogen peroxide. Because by adding rotenone, you're preventing reverse electron transfer for, from coenzyme Q to complex 1. 
And just as proof of the concept, if you add rhodonone before succinate, respiratory rates are exactly the same, but the production of hydrogen peroxide is low to begin with because complex one was already inhibited. So reverse electron transfer is a very important source of electron leakage, particularly when membrane potentials are high, and particularly in tissues such as brain and heart. So again, reverse electron transfer, an important conclusion is that it's very uh, important in some tissues. Another finding that we saw in this general work, also confirmatory of prior work, was that increased respiratory rates, either promoted by the addition of ADP plus phosphate, so either by promoting state three respiration, or by uncoupling mitochondria, adding uh, mitochondrial protonophore, um, is going to significantly prevent the formation of oxidants. And this is most important in tissues that have high membrane potentials to begin with, and a little less important in tissues such as liver. So we weren't the first to find that increasing respiratory rates decreases the production of superoxide and hydrogen peroxide in mitochondria. This is a paper from 1971 that already saw this very clearly. So what they're looking at here is the oxidation of a probe by hydrogen peroxide, and this oxidation leads to less fluorescence. So this decrease in fluorescence is proportional to the production of hydrogen peroxide in mitochondria. When they add ADP and induce state three respiration in these mitochondria, they basically have no more probe oxidation until ADP is exhausted and these mitochondria go back into state four, and then again they produce hydrogen peroxide. And they see the same cessation of production of hydrogen peroxide when they add an uncoupler of mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, therefore also increasing respiration. So Faster respiratory rates lead to decrease in production of mitochondrial oxidants under most conditions, however not all conditions. Uh, this idea that uncoupling mitochondria is a regulatory uh, effect in mitochondrial oxidant production was really cemented by work from Starkov's group in 1997 where they really showed that the amount of uncoupling that you need to regulate mitochondrial hydrogen peroxide release is quite small. So they titrated very small amounts of uncoupler, and they could decrease the membrane potential very slightly, at most by 20%. And what they saw was that the small decrease in membrane potential, which therefore does not impede oxidative phosphorylation, can actually decrease hydrogen peroxide generation a lot. So mild mitochondrial uncoupling is very effective in preventing the production of oxidants. And that's a really important finding, and that's why also this paper gained a lot of visibility in the literature. It's a very highly cited paper. Um, this was seen in isolated mitochondria, but later our group actually confirmed that mild mitochondrial uncoupling is a very effective antioxidant strategy. And we did this when we treated whole mice with very low doses of dinitrophenol as an uncoupler. Uh, the idea there was to decrease their body weights and see if this had an impact on their lifespans. And in fact, they were less obese and they did have higher lifespans, uh, longer lifespans. But the increase in lifespan that we saw was small, maybe 15%. What we saw that was most striking in these animals that we kept mildly uncoupled for most of their lives was a change in redox state. Um, so if you look at the black bars here, that's of the animals that were mildly uncoupled with dinitrophenol versus the white bars are control animals, and these are all adult animals. We looked at hydrogen peroxide release from different tissues, so these are tissue pieces. Um, we looked at protein carbonyls as a marker of oxidative damage, and we looked at adoxodg as a marker of DNA oxidative damage. And all these parameters were decreased by treatment with uncoupler. And these are normal mice. They're not sick in any manner. So the levels of oxidation in these animals are not very high. And the prevention of these normal levels of oxidation is actually quite striking with the treatment with an uncoupler. So mild mitochondrial uncoupling is really a very effective antioxidant strategy because it prevents the production of oxidants in mitochondria by increasing slightly 
of the respiratory rates, the electron transfer rates. Um, so we saw this effect of mild mitochondrial uncoupling, and it's very important in most tissues. We saw that in liver, it's not quite as important, probably because mitochondrial intermembrane potentials in uh, liver are a little bit lower to begin with. Uh, it is important, however, in liver when respiration is supported by fatty acids, which is a common physiological situation. Finally, a conclusion that I cannot stress enough, and that's what I, why I've bolded it here, is that mitochondrial oxidant formation probably accounts for less than 0.2% of oxygen consumption under any physiologically relevant condition. So it's often repeated that mitochondria can produce up to 1% or 2% of the oxygen that they consume can produce reactive oxygen species. And I believe this sentence came from initial data showing that you have oxygen consumption around 1% or 2% of oxygen consumption generating superoxide in the presence of antamycin, which is an inhibitor of complex 3. Now, of course, antamycin is going to increase this production to its maximum by inhibiting mitochondrial electron transfer. So you cannot take this production of superoxide in the presence of antamycin and consider it the physiological superoxide production. Uh, One to two percent of oxygen consumption is a vast overestimate of how much uh, superoxide we produce in our electron transport chain. It's 0.2% at most, probably less than that under most conditions. And the reason that uh, mitochondrial superoxide and reactive oxygen species production in general is low is that oxidant production by mitochondria is a regulated process. And mitochondria can actually titrate their membrane potentials to regulate mitochondrial oxidant production. And this is really nicely illustrated by the fact that uncoupling pathways in mitochondria are redox sensitive. Um, so in this paper, for example, what you can see is that the mitochondrial membrane potential is decreased under many different conditions by the addition of oxidants, by the addition of xanthine, xanthine oxidase that's going to generate oxidants. This leads to uncoupling in mitochondria, which is totally dependent on the presence of the mitochondrial uncoupling protein. So it doesn't happen in the absence of uncoupling protein. What this means is that the mitochondrial uncoupling protein is redox sensitive, it's activated by oxidation, and it also leads to a decrease in mitochondrial oxidant production. So whenever mitochondria generate more oxidants, they activate this pathway that decreases membrane potentials and therefore decreases oxidant production. And this redox-sensitive uncoupling is not true only for the uncoupling protein. It's also true for mitochondrial potassium transport, which uh, together with potassium proton exchange is also an uncoupling pathway. So potassium transport through the, mito the mitochondrial ATP-sensitive uh, potassium channel is activated by oxidation and reduces mitochondrial oxidant production. So this is a very nice illustration of how physiologically mitochondria control their oxidant production. Uh, and that's why we have low levels of oxidant production under most physiological conditions. So those are the general properties of mitochondrial oxidant production. I'm going to come back in a third video and talk to you how to measure mitochondrial oxidant production. So until then.